The chair recognizes the gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Lamborn, for 30 minutes. Mr. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent that all members have five legislative days in which to revise and extend their remarks and include extraneous materials on the topic of the special order. Without objection. Mr. Speaker, it is my great honor for me to come to the floor tonight to commemorate the 81st annual National Bible Week, a week in which we celebrate the tremendous influence of the Bible on the freedoms we enjoy today in America. In 1941, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt declared the week of Thanksgiving to be National Bible Week on the eve of World War II. In the years since, every president has issued a national proclamation as have many governors and mayors. The Bible has had a profound impact on my own life as well. When I was an 18 year old freshman at the University of Kansas, I was approached by some people who asked me if I knew what was in the Bible. I said, I believed I knew what it was all about. However, I had never read any of it for myself. The only honest thing I could do at that point was to read it for myself. So when I read the Gospel of John, I ended up discovering a personal relationship with Jesus Christ who became my Lord and Savior. In that Gospel, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. So we recognize the Bible's powerful message of hope. We cherish the wisdom of the Bible. We acknowledge its profound role in the founding of our country. And we thank God for providing this holy book. It has truly been as it says, a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. We are here in keeping with tradition to recognize National Bible Week. Mr. Speaker, we have a number of fellow representatives from all across this great country of ours who want to comment on National Bible Week, on the importance of the Bible to them, to their districts, and to the country. And we'll go now first with Mr. Robert Adderholt, and then continue down the list in the order that people arrived here. So I recognize the gentleman from Alabama, Representative Robert Adderholt. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, it's uh, great to be here today to uh, recognize National Bible Week and especially along with my colleague, uh, Doug Lamborn from uh, the great state of Colorado. Uh, and I appreciate his willingness to uh, organize this this evening and to uh, call attention to uh, a book that has has had more impact on uh, world history than any other book that I think uh, that has ever been written. And uh, I just want to say that here in this chamber, we are reminded as we look around that uh, the, of the influence the Bible has had. I uh, look around the room here and see the reliefs of uh, many lawgivers that were depicted around the top of the ceiling that shows that uh, there were men over the ages that have contributed to the making of laws. And it is, of course, to remind us what our job here is to make uh, great laws. But what strikes me is the one that's over the main door that is over the Capitol, uh, I'm sorry, the main door that leads into the House chamber here in the Capitol, and that's uh, a relief of Moses. And the relief of Moses uh, that is behind me uh, is different from the other reliefs there. He's either looking to the left nor to the right. He's looking straight down, uh, actually on you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, I don't think it's any coincidence when they designed this room that uh, they had that in mind that uh, Moses was the great lawgiver because he gave the laws that uh, came from God. And of course, above the speaker's chair is the words in God we trust. So it is uh, on and on throughout the Capitol building itself, you see the, uh, the, we remember that the Bible has such a significant part. But there's one painting here in the Capitol building that I wanna call your attention to as in closing that a lot of uh, people don't really think about, and that's the signing of the Constitution. They have seen this painting, but it's uh, here just a few steps from where I stand right now, uh, and it was painted in 1940. Uh, the artist was uh, commissioned to, to design a painting showing the signing of the Constitution in Philadelphia. And in that painting, you will see several uh, of the delegates, and most of the delegates are actually depicted in that particular painting. And in that particular painting, 
You have George Washington that's presiding over the, the signing of the Constitution. You can see Ben Franklin prominently uh, depicted there and uh, several other of the founding fathers that you can see depicted. Uh, but on the far right at the bottom, you will see one of the delegates there uh, who it was Delegate Robert Morris from Pennsylvania. And unless you look closely at that painting, you may not notice, but he has his elbow on the table and right beside his elbow is a book that is open. And if you're like me, you may have passed by that painting on many occasions, but never noticed what that book was about because you just think it's maybe some law book that was open there during that particular time. But quite honestly, if you look closely at the painting, you can see that it says St. Matthew chapter five. And I can't help but believe that during the discussions that day when they were drawing up the constitution and signing it, that that particular book of the Bible had a very significant impact, uh, importance upon the, the uh, discussion that was made there. And because of that, uh, I've read through chapter five of, of Matthew and tried to really sort of figure out what it is that maybe they were talking about that particular day. But uh, I can only guess that one of the verses that in chapter five that they may have been paying attention to in particular was the verse that says, don't hide your light under a bushel and let your light shine before men. And they wanted the United States of America to be a light to the rest of the world. They wanted it to be a city on a hill that would not be hid. And that's a, exactly what I believe that our nation has done over the last 250 years. So, Mr. Uh, Speaker, it's great to, to be have a chance to talk about the uh, Bible, the National Bible Week, and I congratulate my colleague, Congressman Lamborn, for his work here. And uh, thank you for us being able to draw attention uh, to this uh, book that has really changed the life of so many, uh, literally millions of people around the world. I yield back. Okay, I thank the gentleman. Secondly, we'll have uh, the gentleman from Texas, Representative Babin, and then a gentleman from Mississippi after that. I wish to thank my good friend, from uh, Mr. Lamborn from Colorado for having this special order for National Bible Week. For, um, and I yield two minutes. Okay. Mr. Speaker, I'm elated to once again recognize National Bible Week and to share why God's word is such an immovable pillar, not only in my life, but millions and millions of people's. From guidance and encouragement to past lessons and future promises, the Bible holds the answers to all of it. Our nation is in the midst of a moral and spiritual war currently, the likes of which we have never seen. The rule of law is being trampled. Men compete in women's sports Child pornography is used to sell clothing. Babies continue to be murdered even after a botched abortion. Now more than ever, the direction of God's word is crucial. As we maneuver through these woke and morally corrupt times, I pray that we as a country, the great United States of America, the shining city on a hill, would find our way back to the teachings of scripture. America would not even exist today had God's divine providence and written word not stirred the hearts of our founding fathers 246 years ago. Only a fool would think that our nation could ever survive without God. I'll close with a biblical passage and I pray that we remember Proverbs 3, 5 through 6. Trust in the Lord with all of thine heart. Lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways, acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Thank you, and I yield back. I thank the gentleman. Next, I would like to hear from the gentleman from Mississippi, Representative Guest. President Ronald Reagan once said, within the covers of the Bible are the answers for all the problems men face. The Bible has provided our nation with wisdom and guidance over our history. Within this chamber, members of Congress have gathered to debate and openly decide the most significant challenges to our country. And since 1962, 
we have worked under those simple yet powerful words, the words etched behind me, and God we trust. Without God's direction, we would have faced these challenges alone. As we face the future, we must never forget that our nation was founded on biblical principles, <coughs> recognizing that we are blessed to live in a country that we can worship freely, and we must work to see that we always remain one nation under God. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not into your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. My hope is that all Americans will continue to live by the truth and wisdom found in the word of God. Thank you and may God continue to bless the United States of America. I appreciate what the gentleman had to share. And next, next we will hear from the gentleman from Tennessee, Representative John Rose. Mr. Speaker, I thank the gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Lamborn, for yielding and for claiming the time this evening to acknowledge and honor our nation's 81st National Bible Week. Mr. Speaker, tomorrow marks 81 years since the world changed forever when Japanese pilots attacked Pearl Harbor, killing 2,403 Americans and pulling America into the Second World War. World War. We will never forget their sacrifices. Today, after that infamous day, the National Broadcasting Company, the leading radio station at the time, began the day with the founders of the National Bible Association. As the news of the gruesome attack on U.S. soil broke, producers at NBC requested that the National Bible Association continue reading the Bible all throughout the day. Coincidentally, before the attack on Pearl Harbor, President Roosevelt had invited the founders of the National Bible Association to the White House to help commemorate the first National Bible Week. However, they canceled and left a telegram for President Roosevelt stating, may God bless and guide you in this emergency. This story reminds me of Mark 13, 31, where Jesus says, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. As we recognize our country's 81st National Bible Week, I remember that uh, I remember that through that, that although we may choose to leave God's words behind, the Lord's words will never leave us behind. Every day it seems as though there is a story in the news that shows our country turning away from God. High school football coaches are being fired for praying on the field. The Bible is no longer being taught in our schools, and it has become almost scandalous to want to live a life practicing the traditional Christian values we are taught in the Bible. But remember, no matter what, the Lord's words will never pass away. And I hope that one day our country will embrace the Lord again. As a devoted Christian, I am proud to recognize National Bible Week, and I pray that I will be able to bring more souls to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. But until then, may God continue to bless our great nation. Thank you, and I yield back. I appreciate what the gentleman had to say. Uh, tomorrow will be the 81st anniversary of Pearl Harbor Day, that day that has lived in infamy. Uh, now we are yield two minutes to the gentleman from Wisconsin, Representative Glenn Grothman. Thank you for organizing this uh, little group of speeches here. As has been mentioned, the first National Bible Week was less than two weeks before Pearl Harbor in 1941. And why do we have a National Bible Week? Because the Bible was the preeminent text of our forefathers when they wrote our Constitution. To leave you with a couple of quotes, George Washington said, it's impossible to govern the world without God and the Bible. Of all the dispositions and habits that lead to political prosperity, our belief, our religious and morality are indispensable supporters. And John Jay, the first Chief Justice of the US, the Bible is the best of all works, the best of all books, for it is the word of, for it is the word of God and teaches us the way to be happy in this world and the next. Continue therefore to read it and regulate your life by its precepts. Clearly, if you want to understand the Constitution, you have to understand the Bible. 
And that's why John Adams said that the Constitution is made only for a more religious people and totally unfit for any other kind. Now, as it just been mentioned, uh, well, well, first of all, the most read book or most cited book by our forefathers in the Old Testament was Deuteronomy. I've always felt the reason they quoted Deuteronomy so much is they wanted America to be the type of country that God had wanted Israel to be. In Deuteronomy, it ends with the death of Moses and has been mentioned in the uh, relief up here, the wisest man or the man with the most important position in this room is Moses, which shows that Congress, even at the time we built the, uh, built this capital, talked about the importance of the Bible in understanding what behavior should be and in understanding what our Constitution is made a reference to. In any event, I would like to thank Congressman Lamborn one more time for putting together this ceremony and encourage particularly all the young people out there to read the Bible so you understand the basis of our country. I thank the gentleman. He mentioned John Adams. I do have a great quote here from John Adams. John Quincy Adams, that is the, the younger of the two Adamses who became president. I speak as a man of the world to men of the world, and I say to you, search the scriptures. The Bible is the book of all others to be read at all ages and in all conditions of human life. Not to be read once or twice or thrice through and then laid aside, but to be read in small portions of one or two chapters every day and never to be intermitted unless by overruling necessity. I now yield two minutes to the gentleman from Nebraska, Representative Don Bacon. Thank you, Congressman Landborn. I appreciate you organizing this. I thank God for the Bible. The Bible is God's word, and it tells us who God is, that he loves us, that he made us and created the world, that he has an eternal plan for us. The Bible gives me hope. It teaches me how to live, love, forgive, be humble, have self-control, and to be kind. It has given me my life me life's roadmap and a compass to steer me right. Knowing God's eternal plan that he gave guidelines on how to live gives me meaning in life. Without meaning, I would not have been able to face the darkest days of my life, like when I lost my best friend and sister. I've lost four siblings and my mom. Without God, I would not have been able to move forward on many of these days. One of my favorite hymns says, I can face tomorrow because he lives. My theme verse that comes to for Matthew says, do not store up treasures on earth where moth and rust can destroy, and where thieves break in and steal, but store up treasures in heaven where moth and rust nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in or steal. When I was deployed in Iraq in 2007 and 8, and we were losing so many soldiers, brothers and sisters in arms, I thought on this verse, of this other verse from Matthew every single day. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. I knew Al-Qaeda and the Shia militias could possibly kill me, but I was assured that my soul was secured with God. When things are not going well, I think of Paul's words, when God told him, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Now that I'm in political office, I often apply this verse, one that I overlooked much of my life. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. We are all imperfect and need God's redemption. Thankfully, God sent his only son to take the punishment of the sins we commit. He saved us. The Bible assures us that when we put our faith in him, we are redeemed. John Newton famously wrote, when we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we've no lost days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. Thank you. I yield back. I thank the gentleman for sharing that uh, message from the heart, and I appreciate what the Bible has done in his life. And now I'd like to yield two minutes to the gentleman from Georgia, Representative Rick Allen. Uh, thank you, uh, Congressman Lamborn, for uh, arranging this. Mr. Speaker, when uh, President Roosevelt convened the inaugural celebration of National Bible Week, as it was mentioned, it was 1941. <clears throat> America was still recovering from an economic collapse, and across the sea, war raged in Europe. It seemed the whole world was shrouded in darkness. But Roosevelt believed in what that the Bible is an eternal, eternal source of hope. 
We know that the Bible is life-changing. As I mentioned uh, about the news of the attack, and as mentioned before, NBC was broadcasting the reading of the Bible. They made a monumental decision during that process. As they were broadcasting the news, during breaks, they would continue to read the Bible. They recognized one simple truth. There is no greater spiritual armor than the Word of God. So where are we some 81 years later? Uh, the pollsters say that seven in 10 Americans believe that our nation is in crisis and at the risk of collapse. There continues to be wars and rumors of wars. But I believe as Roosevelt believed in the awesome life-changing power of God's word. Ephesians 6 says, put on the full armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Uh, as we look around our chamber here, uh, fellow members, we are without excuse. As mentioned earlier, we have in God we trust here, we have lawmakers all around us, and obviously the full face of Moses who gave us the first four chapters of the Bible. Uh, some 40 years later, after uh, uh, Bible Week was declared, <coughs> Billy Graham uh, gave this prayer, uh, and I'll read part of it. He said, Our Father and our God, Thou hast said, Blessed is that nation whose God is the Lord. We recognize on this historic occasion that we are a nation under God. We thank thee for this torch of faith handed to us by our forefathers. May we never let it be extinguished. Thou alone has given us our prosperity, our freedom, and our power. This faith in God is our heritage and our foundation. Thou hast warned us in the scriptures, if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? As George Washington reminded us in his farewell address, morality and faith are the pillars of our society. We confess these pillars are being eroded in an increasingly materialistic and permissive society. The whole world is watching to see if the faith of our fathers will stand the trials and tests of this hour. Too long we have neglected thy word and ignored thy laws. Too long we have tried to solve our problems without reference to thee. Too long we have tried to live by bread alone. We have sown to the wind are now reaping the whirlwind of crime, division, and rebellion. That was said, that prayer was given in 1969, and here we are today. So just as we turn to the Bible then, I pray that we will return to it now. Thank you, sir, and I yield back. I thank the gentleman from Georgia, and I would like to now introduce another gentleman from Georgia, Buddy Carter of Savannah, Georgia, for two minutes. I thank the gentleman for yielding, and I thank you for sponsoring this. This is certainly important, important to all of us who are believers, and I count myself as one of those. Mr. Speaker, I rise today in celebration of one of the greatest gifts that God has given us, his word that is the Bible. As we near the holiday season, we must be mindful of why we celebrate, which is the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. As we enter the Christmas season, it's easy to be consumed by the laundry list of items and tasks that must be completed before you host or travel to see family and friends. It's easy to become lost and forget the true meaning and purpose of Christmas. Friends and fellow Americans, I urge you to remain grounded in the true story of Christmas because it is indeed some great news. Luke chapter two, verses nine through 11 tells us, an angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. Wow, what a powerful moment that must have been to the shepherds that night. The Christmas story is the greatest feel-good story anyone could ever ask for. 
that no matter how we sin, what we do, or disagreements we may have, the Lord our God, the living God, sent his one and only son to die for each of us so that we may all join him in eternal paradise. Now that is the awesome Christmas gift. Thank you to my friend from, Cal from Colorado for hosting this important special order. And it indeed is important, particularly during this time of year. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I yield back. I want to thank Representative Carter for reminding us what the reason for the season really is. Appreciate that. And now another gentleman from the great state of Georgia, Andrew Clyde, representative who has two minutes. Thank you, Congressman Lamborn, for leading this important special order. Mr. Speaker, I rise today in honor and celebration of National Bible Week. For multiple millenniums, the Bible has served as God's revelation to his creation providing an account of his divine plan. The future hope of glory through the gospel of the word of God renders guidance to us so that we have the hope of eternal life offered by his grace through faith. The Bible is also the very reason we can live freely in the United States of America. For more than 400 years, settlers bound together in search of the new world to escape religious persecution and establish a free government. Our founding fathers wove the word of God into the very fabric of our nation, with the Bible playing a critical role in the unity and success of these wise men as they forged a future that is free. As John Adams once said, and I quote, the Bible contains the most profound philosophy, the most perfect morality, and the most refined policy that ever was conceived upon earth. It is because of these men that our Lord and Savior's guidance has been key to the preservation of our Republic. Now, more than two centuries later, I pray this body uses God's word as our guiding light. Because a government whose foundation is built on God and his word is a government that will have peace, freedom, and liberty. Thank you. I thank the gentleman for those thoughts on this commemoration of the National Bible Week. To conclude, Mr. Speaker, I have two more quotes from other presidents of the United States. Ronald Reagan, in his own declaration of National Bible Week, said when he was in office, when I took the oath of office, I requested the Bible be opened to 2 Chronicles 7.14, which reads, quote, if my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways that I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. This passage expresses my hope for the future of this nation and the world. And lastly, to make this bipartisan, President Truman said that um, during an address at the Attorney General's Conference on Law Enforcement Problems, Quote, the fundamental basis of this nation's law was given to Moses on the Mount. The fundamental basis of our Bill of Rights comes from the teachings which we get from Exodus and St. Matthew, from Isaiah and St. Paul. I don't think we emphasize that enough these days. If that was true in the late 1940s, that's certainly true today. He continued, if we don't have the proper fundamental moral background, we will finally end up with a totalitarian government which does not believe the rights for anybody except the state. So I'm gonna conclude by saying this, Mr. Speaker, it's been an honor and a pleasure to commemorate National Bible Week this evening. I'm grateful for all of my colleagues who joined me to honor the word of God. The Bible is the single most important book ever written. It has the power to change lives. It has liberated many from oppression by its clear teachings. It's truly an amazing and remarkable piece of writing. It contains pure truth about God, about life, the nature of mankind, and our own hearts as human beings. I am thankful for the word of God, the impact it has had on my life, on the lives of those who have spoken here today, and on the life of our great nation Thank you, and I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back.